Hello there, and thank you for pressing play on episode 306 of Stand Up. Joining me today, political scientist Dr. Miranda Yaver for the first time, and writer, author, podcaster, friend of the show and mine, Jared Yates Sexton, joins me as well. I am Pete Dominic. It's time to stand up with me right now. Stand up. Well, hello. Hello. What have we here, huh? <laughs> I gotcha. Caught you red-handed. I don't know what I'm talking about. I don't really script out the beginning of the show very well. I just start yapping, press record, hit the ground running. Awesome conversations, interviews for you today. Very excited about both of my guests. Booked a whole bunch of guests for the rest of the week, but as always, let me know who you'd like to hear on the program, especially if they've never been on before. I try to get a few people every week here on the show that are making their debuts, their first appearance. They get nervous. It's like they say it's like The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson. They don't say that. Nobody really I don't know that they get nervous. I think it's just nerve wracking when you light up Zoom and meet a new person for the first time. That can be a little bit weird when you've never talked to somebody. Just all of a sudden, there they are, and, and you're chatting. It's not weird to me. I mean, these people used to come into the studio, and now everything's on. It's all virtual, but it is weird to me to do person virtually, isn't it? All right. Well, every day here on Stand Up Daily, I talk about the most important issues that matter to you, your family, your community, your country, your planet. And today I'm doing just that, opening the show, as always, with a robust news segment. This is the... Last 24, ladies and gentlemen, what happened in the last 24 hours in news in the world? Bring you up to speed as much as I can. And we start with the fact that yesterday was International Women's History Day. I didn't do anything specific to mark that here on the show. Frankly, I didn't even realize that it was that day or I would have done something. But I do have some clips for you to share with you uh, from the president, Joe Biden, who has signed two executive orders on Monday to advance gender equality on International Women's History Day. Here is the president talking about this issue, which he's been a strong advocate for for years as one of the champions of the Violence Against Women Act and more. Here he is. Throughout Women's History Month, our administration will honor the vital contributions of women to our nation and show women's history is American history. For me, it starts with Jill the first first lady to work full time while she's in office and Kamala, our vice president, shattered a barrier that stood for more than two centuries and a record number of women serving in my cabinet, senior level positions in our administration. But it's also all those women we think about each day who are leading us through this pandemic. Vaccine researchers, public health officials, essential workers, so many of whom are women and women of color in hospitals, nursing homes, on farms and grocery stores and schools and shelters. They've risked their own lives and their own health to keep our country going. But we must also reflect on the unique burdens women are continue to bear today. The health care system is historically underserved women. Gender and racial disparities in pay continue to fester. A disproportionate share of caregiving continues to fall on the shoulders of women and girls. Millions of women have left the workforce this past year, setting women's labor participation in the workforce at its lowest level in 30 years, preventing them and the country from reaching our full potential. Hunger, homelessness, violence against women is on the rise. These trends are even more dire among women of color. This is unprecedented in America. This is unacceptable to me. For our administration, honoring women means investing in them each and every day. With America's rescue plan to continue and fight this pandemic, deliver immediate economic relief to millions of women and their families. With the plan to build back better with an economy that's stronger, more inclusive, creating good jobs for women. And it's establishing the White House Gender Policy Council, I'm establishing, to prioritize gender equality across every aspect of the government. So there he is. I cut him off there. But yeah, he is uh, it, the executive orders established the White House Gender Policy Council. 
which address gender equality and human rights of women and girls to ensure that every domestic and foreign policy we pursue rests on a foundation of dignity and equity for women, which is a huge change from the last president who actually looked for men who were serial abusers of women. And then once he found them, he put them in charge of important agencies. Okay, so moving on, here is the first female vice president of the United States of America, Kamala Harris, also making remarks on International Women's Day. We gather at the start of an important week um, for our country. Yes, we are honoring the women of our country and the world. Um, But this is also a week for our country that could mark a real turning point in our fight against COVID-19. Last weekend, as you know, the House of Representatives passed our American Rescue Plan. It is a plan that will provide immediate relief to America's cities, towns, and villages, and directly to the American people. This past weekend, the Senate advanced this landmark legislation. And very soon, the President of the United States, Joe Biden, will sign the American Rescue Plan into law. How about that? Kamala Harris yesterday touting the American Rescue Plan, which is going to do so much good. And Nobel Prize winning economist Paul Krugman, who has been pretty accurate in his predictions about economic policies over the past 10 to 20 years, really, the New York Times columnist was on MSNBC with Chris Hayes on All In. And he's really, really happy and sees his forecasting as well as a lot of other economists some pretty good outcomes as a result of the rescue bill. Yeah, I I have to say it's, uh, you know, I I spent most of my career as a pundit, you know, just making arguments that turn out, I'm not always right, but making arguments that turn out to be right and end up being vindicated in principle, but never getting a chance to have it right in real time. Uh, This time, the Democrats actually acted on it. Uh, People actually learned the lesson and did the right thing. So, uh, I mean, it's... uh, I'm, I'm pinching myself, wondering if this is some kind of a, of a dream, because we really are actually responding more or less adequately to the crisis at hand. But I also like this exchange between Chris Hayes and Paul Krugman talking about where we're at and how to compare it to past economic disasters. You know, one thing I, I think about now is we watch the vaccinations, which are right about 2.2 million a day. When we conceive of the possibility of getting to some kind of herd immunity, plus this rescue money. You know, I'm not a, I'm certainly not an economic prognosticator, but the second half of this year, particularly the last quarter, like it could be really good. Right. I mean, there is a lot of pent up demand. We haven't lost. It's not a natural disaster that took out huge amounts of physical capital. Like the airplanes are all there. The hotels are all there. Broadway's still there. Like you just got to you know, you, we could have a pretty good second half of this year. Yeah, there isn't even the kind of overhang of bad debt that we had last right. time around. So so we really are. I mean, uh to coin a phrase, this could very well be morning in America. I mean, I'm uh, Goldman Sachs, and they have a very good team of economists, whatever else you may think of them. They are predicting that we really are going to have close to 8 percent growth this year, which is a, a morning in America level of growth, enough to get the economy more or less back to full employment by early next year. Um, now, that's not the end of the story. You know, there's a tremendous amount of stuff we need to do uh, down the line. But I'm I'm expecting that you know, a, a year from now, we're going to be looking and saying, wow, incredible how much better things have gotten. All right. Paul Krugman, Nobel winning economist on MSNBC. I thought that was very optimistic and uh, made me feel good. Although every time I hear uh, about the economy humming along and, and things going better, uh, I always think about consumption and climate and fossil fuel burning. So it's always tempered in my mind. Moving on, though, let's uh, get to one more remark on the rescue plan and the analysis of it with brand spanking new handsome young Senator John Ossoff of Georgia. Ninety percent of Americans are going to qualify for the stimulus checks or the tax credits. Zero percent of the tax credits or the stimulus checks go to the top one percent. This is a profound difference in economic philosophy. This legislation is about economic recovery from the bottom up and the middle out by getting more cash into the pockets and bank accounts of working class people, middle class people, and working families. On the economic policy side, you've got 
the stimulus checks at $1,400 per individual. That includes $1,400 per child. That includes $1,400 per adult dependent. So college students for the first time will be eligible for those checks. So lots of good news potentially on the economy, but so many other issues to talk about. And of course, as I just mentioned moments ago, climate change is number one for me, the environment and the future for our kids and their kids. And Mehdi Hassan of MSNBC interviewed young environmental activist Greta Thunberg on his program on MSNBC. And I I love this exchange. And she's just such a smart, mature and thoughtful young lady who has also become pretty politically savvy for such a young person. Take a listen. In your view, how has Joe Biden done on climate issues in his first 50 days in office? What grade would you give him? Well, um, you shouldn't take that from me. I'm just a just a teenager, so I I'm not I don't have the mandate to to sort of give grades like that. Uh, my opinions on this doesn't matter. You should rather look at the science and whether his policies are in line with the uh, Paris Agreement and to stay below two. 1.5 or even 2 degrees Celsius. And then you can clearly see that, no, it's not nearly enough in line with the science. And that's not me saying that's just black and white looking at the facts. Yeah. What would you like to see him do to fight climate change that he isn't doing, that he said he won't do? Because his administration is saying we've set up a climate office, we've set up a climate czar, we've re-signed Paris, we're conserving more land, we're undoing a lot of what Donald Trump did. What would you like to see him do that he's not doing? I mean, I understand that it's difficult. And to be honest, I would not want to be in a politician's position right now. I can't imagine how hard it must be. Uh, But, I mean... I would just like him to, I mean, to basically just treat the climate crisis like a crisis. Uh, They have said themselves that this is an existential threat and uh, they better treat it accordingly, uh, which they are not. I mean, they are just treating climate, the climate crisis like as it was a political topic um, among other topics. And um, yeah, treat it as a crisis. That's the number one step we need to do and to spread it. Okay, Greta Thunberg on MSNBC with Mehdi Hassan. Always great. She's great. Real inspiration. Okay, and uh, not a very much of an inspiration was uh, what we saw last night. I don't know. I was just trying to pivot. I don't know if it's an inspiration. I was trying to have a segue to talk about Oprah, Meghan, and Harry. Have you been watching? Have you been paying attention? Are you all wrapped up in that? I really am trying not to care, but some very interesting points have been made about the royal family and race. And so I did get uh, sucked into it. And I loved this two minute fight that took place on a British morning television show with Piers Morgan, who you're probably familiar with. He's a pretty insufferable guy. It's a good morning Britain. I think it is. Well, they had a guest on who rolled all over Piers Morgan. And normally I don't love crosstalk. I don't think really anybody does. I hate when I do it uh, or having to listen to it. But I I just love that she doesn't let him talk and calls him disgusting. I thought this was great. Here is Dr. Shola Moss Shagbamimu, an author and a women's rights activist, the author of This Is Why I Resist, uh, with Piers Morgan. And ooh, I think it's pretty good. You completely forget all of that to paint this picture that all was rosy and hunky-dory. Nonsense. And then you were lording over the queen. Listen, by all means, let's applaud the queen when she does something right. But when she does something wrong, we need to call her out. What does she what do kind wrong? Of what does she what do kind wrong? Of grandmother? Let me finish. What kind of grandmother will be so close to her, to her grandson, Harry, but then not use her power and influence as queen to protect them from the racist media coverage. What kind of grandmother will protect her own son, Prince Andrew, from the potential crime of raping a minor, but will do jack all to protect Harry and Meghan, especially, I have no doubt that she would have heard about the suicidal thoughts and the help and support she needs. And then you sit there, hammering on about how the royal institution is not racist. Are you out of your godforsaken mind? No, you know what? I find what you're saying about the Queen actually disgraceful. I find what you're saying... You're entitled to your opinion, Shola. I find... Sorry, no, I'm allowed to respond to what you've just said. ...is rooted... Listen, you might learn something. 
The royal family as an institution is rooted in colonialism, white supremacy, and racism. The legacy is right there. So you are now surprised that a comment would have been made by several members of the royal family about how dark Archie is. It's not several is. members, actually. No, no, outfaced. you can't spew you lies. All right. Harry and Meghan are we allowed to engage in any of this? Actual, let me finish. Well, you're, you're not stopping. That Harry and Meghan had the audacity to speak that truth, then you should be at the actual outrage of racism. Right, OK. You, you, Am I allowed to respond to this? Am I allowed to respond yet? You, you can respond now. OK. I think what you've just said about the Queen is disgusting. I think it's unbelievable. You are are you talking you about? Are you talk about the behaviour of a man. Am I lying when I said that? Allow me to me, say I what I'm. Lying lying allow me to explain. And the institution is protected. Right. Allow me to. Allow me to defend our royal family. Harry. Thank you. You tell me. I just love that. I just loved it. I, <laughs> Piers Morgan, not a great performance. He really got his ass handed to him by his guest and. I also want to play for you J.L. Covan, who did uh, reactions with three of his great impersonations, starting with Andrew Cuomo, Donald Trump, and Dave Chappelle, all reacting to the bombshell interview. I think that we have to be more sensitive to the needs of women, especially women of color like Meghan Markle. And when she said that she did not want to live, it, I was hurt for her. And I wanted to reach out and ask her if she needed a ventilator. I watched this interview, which was, to be honest, so much nicer than the way a lot of these people would interview me. And I have to admit, when they were saying that the royals... These people in England, who we defeated very strongly, by the way, in the revolution, like so many years ago, like 80 years ago. But what I want to know, what I want to know is why when we have a full black royalty in coming to America, too, why they weren't getting invited to Oprah. We should have been talking to motherfuckers from, you know, Zamunda. Hell, I would have taken Wakanda. I don't give a fuck about any of these. To me, the British royal family is as fake as Wakanda and Zamunda. Yeah, well done, J.L. Covan. And finally, here is a video, an interview clip from The Late Show with Stephen Colbert and HBO John Oliver, these two guys, old colleagues from The Daily Show. Uh, this is from a, a little over a year ago or before, just before the royal wedding between Prince Henry and Meghan Markle and John Oliver had some pretty good advice. Uh, it, I just thought this is real good. It was going around on Twitter yesterday. Well, speaking of royal wedding, I mean, yeah. you're English. You must be really excited about the royal wedding. No. Yeah. Yeah. No, I don't, <laughs> Come on. I, I, don't, I don't really. You got to be. Really? Look, he's a Brit. He's marrying he an American yeah. girl. You're British. You married an American woman. You got any tips for him? I would not blame her if she pulled out of this at the last minute. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't think you need to have just seen the pilot episode of The Crown to get a basic sense of she might be marrying into a family that could cause her some emotional complications. <laughs> but this generation seems like nice people, right? They're all nice now, right? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's, there, there are, there are an emotionally stunted group of fundamentally flawed people doing a very silly pseudo-job. That's what she's marrying into. <laughs> so I, I, I hope she likes it. It's going to be weird for her. I, I, I would not marry into the royal family. I'm, I'm a commoner. I would not be welcome, especially after what I've just said. I'm guessing the queen... <laughs> the queen is probably... Could sitting, you get a knighthood? Could you get a knighthood? I, well, theoretically, I could. Yeah? I, she's probably ripping that up as we speak. There we go. <laughs> Insolent little bastard, you're not coming now, are you? I thought that was great. How prescient of John Oliver. And the uh, last thing I want to play for you before I get to the news dump is uh, Papa John's founder says he's been working to uh, get the N word out of his vocabulary for the last uh, 20 months. His name is John Schnatter. You know, this guy, former CEO of Papa John's. Well, he's assuring the public he's been working on not using racist language. And you just have to hear this clip from 
right wing conspiracy, quote, news network OAN, because it makes it sound like he's struggling to stop using the N word like he's almost like he's addicted to it. And um, if this is supposed to be his public relations repair of his image, I'm not sure it's going very well, Papa John. Take me back to a few years ago when you start to see these headlines coming out and smearing your good name. How did you feel at the time when you were seeing these headlines? Um, state of shock. Um, unbelievable. Um, I couldn't understand it. I, I mean, again, you have a public board that paints its chairman uh, complicit, passive or active. They paint the founder as a racist. They know he's not a racist. It's just unbelievable. And I used to lay in bed just going, how did they do this? And we've had three goals for the last 20 months to get rid of this uh, N-word uh, in my uh, vocabulary and dictionary and everything else uh, because it's just not true. Figure out how they did this and get on with my life. If Papa John's would just say, hey, we got in a hurry, we didn't follow. Pro okay, I've heard enough. Thank you very much. All right, before I get the news dump, final headlines here. Uh, the the president, uh, former president, oh, that feels so much better to say, he wants supporters to boycott every Republican or conservative political organization and instead donate directly to him. On Monday, he lashed out at, uh, at all the rest of the Republicans and called them in Rub Republicans in name only. And uh, he put out a post saying no more money for rhinos. They they do nothing to hurt the Republican Party in our great voting base. They'll never lead us to greatness. Send your donation to Save America PAC. And then he lists the website, which I won't list. Uh, he wants all the money to come to him. What's he going to do with it? Do you think he's going to use it to help other Republicans get elected? Of course not. He's going to use it to pay his debts. And he didn't start his own party. Too complicated to be competitive, according to New York Times' Maggie Haberman. But... Still trying to set himself as a place where money for Republicans should go. And that's because he needs it real badly. Also wanted to mention new guidelines from the CDC about folks who've been vaccinated. I'm taking the girls up to my parents this weekend, uh, I think on Thursday. And I'm really excited because now they have gotten their it's been two weeks since they got their vaccine and the new CDC headlines say that we can go, that we can be with them and lots of questions and lots of answers. I'll be talking with Dr. Henry Raymond. I'm scheduled to at least uh, from Rutgers University about it yesterday, but all kinds of questions that we can ask. Do the new guidelines apply to people who receive both shots or one? I was exposed to someone with COVID-19. Do I have to quarantine? This is people who've been vaccinated. What about travel? Can I see my grandparents? Uh, am I safe to go about normal activities in public, eating out, getting haircuts, etc.? Can I gather with large groups? And so lots of questions being answered by the CDC. New guidelines put up. And I'll uh, be talking with Dr. Henry Raymond right here on Stand Up Daily tomorrow's podcast. But you can look these things up as well. I'm just very excited to be with my parents and, and, and bring the girls up there and have pop teach my daughter to drive that should be really really fun looking forward to that what a a great lucky fortunate man i am and now it's time for today's news dump it's not politics it's not covid but it is important and interesting here is the news dump let's start with a new scientific report from japan where scientists have discovered the ultimate case of regeneration yeah, apparently they discovered that some decapitated sea slugs can regrow hearts and whole new bodies. This, quote, wonder of nature reported in the Biology Journal on Monday could eventually help scientists better understand and tackle regeneration of human tissue. So I guess we just skip hair regrowth altogether. So that's it. Still no hope for the bald. All right, now let's head to Wyoming, where there's news that uh, it may become the next state to outlaw capital punishment. That's right. A bill was introduced in the state Senate last week by Republican Senator Brian Boner. That's his name. It says B-O-N-E-R. And he's had to live with that name his whole life. And so he said uh, that he'd end the death penalty as potential punishment for a murder conviction. Boner told ABC News that the current law in effect since 1976 is antiquated and cost taxpayers over $750,000 a year. He went on to say that it's been not been really difficult uh, his entire life to live with the last name uh, Boner. 
And finally, he said, we're dealing with a significant budget crisis. We're looking at old rules that don't work. It's time to get rid of it. All right. I applaud Republican Senator Brian Boner. It's finally something to agree with a Republican over. Really is too bad about that name, though. A judge has ended the shooting case against Breonna Taylor's uh, boyfriend. A judge in Kentucky signed an order to permanently closing a criminal case against Breonna Taylor's boyfriend. And in a somewhat related story in terms of uh, uh, cops killing black people, the Derek Chauvin murder trial for George Floyd uh, has been temporarily postponed because the prosecution, I think, is seeking different charges. Some confusion there. Uh, I'm not sure when it's going to pick back up, but I'm definitely following that. Supposed to start yesterday. Now let's head to France, where a French billionaire aviation industrialist and member of parliament died in a helicopter crash along with a pilot. Olivier Dassault was 69 years old. He was heir to a powerful family business empire that made Falcon private jets and Rafale fighter planes and owned many other businesses, including a Le Figaro newspaper. And uh, apparently uh, he died in in an accident, according to the French National Air Accident Investigation Agency. The Airbus helicopter crashed just after takeoff from a private airfield. Man, one of the real consequences of being super rich, flying around on private helicopters and jets that crash more often than commercial ones. And in a horrible PR, PR disaster, worse than their terrible french fries, Burger King facing fierce backlash over what a lot of people have said is a pretty sexist tweet intended to celebrate International Women's Day, but the official Twitter account for the Burger King's uh, uh, British locations took to the social media platform to, to declare, quote, women belong in the kitchen. What? Apparently the comment was apparent it was a riff on the phrase and meant to highlight inequality within the restaurant industry. But most people thought the joke was in real poor taste. And uh, responding, uh, the initial tweet caused a, a, such a huge stir, they went on to add more context in a series of follow-up t- tweets that were shared immediately after they pressed send on the first tweet, uh, including one that said, I mean, if they want to, of course, yet only 20% of chefs are women. And then they went on to talk about that they're on a mission to change the gender ratio in the restaurant in- industry by empowering female employees with the opportunity to pursue a culinary career, and then they try to sweep up the mess in the fry room uh, a little bit more with a couple more tweets, but what a hilarious disaster for Burger King. And I wonder if anybody is just going to take a stand, like anti-sexist stand, like, you know what? I can't believe Burger King said that sexist shit on Twitter. I am no longer going to buy their garbage food and put it in my body. I don't think so. I don't think anybody took that stand. Do you? All right, that is today's news dump. And now it's time to get to my first guest today on Stand Up. Coming up, political scientist uh, Miranda, Dr. Miranda Yaver for the first time. But right now, uh, another one of my favorite guests joins me fairly regularly. He is an American author and political commentator from Indiana. He's an associate professor at the Department of Writing and Linguistics at Georgia Southern University, and he's written a very, very important book. He's written several books, but uh, his most recent book is called American Rule, How a Nation Conquered the World But Failed Its People. He is also the host of the Muckrake Podcast. He does a weekly live YouTube show, and uh, Jared Yates Sexton, prolific on Twitter, where he's got over 250,000 followers at J.Y. Sexton. We covered everything from the drama regarding the Harry Meghan Oprah, praise be upon her name, uh, interview to uh, everything else, the rescue package and the Republican Party and the future of American democracy. Here now, my latest conversation with the brilliant Jared Yates Sexton. So, Jared, we're talking the day after the massive interview that took over the entire planet, which was Oprah interviewing Prince Harry and Meghan Markle in the coolest backyard I've ever seen. And you have a lot of little off putting how beautiful it was, right? Like, I'm not one for landscapes. I'm not one for putting on airs, but it sort of made me feel Sort of, it was like an out of body experience. Yeah. Do you think that they just waited for the most perfect weather and were like, 
You know what else can change this? A jib camera. This moving <laughs> no, camera. I, I think at that at that pay level, at that level of wealth, I think you can manipulate the weather. So uh, I, I don't even think they had to wait around. I and think it was Oprah. Actually... That was Oprah's budget, not theirs. She was like, I'll move that cloud. If you and I were in a similar setting right now talking with a jib camera moving, don't you think it'd have a similar quality and reach? I think we would look beautiful. <laughs> I really, truly do. What I want, though, in culture and in uh, telecast is more of this random wide shot where you have the two people talking and then you suddenly have three panels that appear and then just disappear. Yes. For no reason whatsoever, but it's beautiful. <laughs> it's, a, it's a really wonderful effect. We need more of that. Now to the important part of it. I, you know, my reaction was this kind of raw, uh, brutal, unknowing of history reaction in yours was of course a concise reaction, well worded based on history, but yet it was kind of similar. My reaction and please refine it was why is anybody surprised by the racism of the Royal family? It's a Royal family. It's a bloodline. I think we ended that in like the 1600s. Why is your jaw dropping? This is completely unsurprising. Well, and I'll tell you what, man, it was like, um, <laughs> my research on my new book, like I'm currently in the 17th century, like right when the British Empire is starting to really take effect. And, you know, the British are looking around, they're like, hey, there's really something to this slave trade and the oppression of people of color. It seems like all these other countries are making a lot of money from that. I wonder if we could do that and build off of it. And what actually happens, of course, is that the British Empire and eventually the American Empire are both built and constructed on white supremacy and the oppression and exploitation of people of color. This whole weird love affair that Americans still have with royal culture, I don't know about you, it creeps me out in a really big way. And it's simply because the royal family, they are a born, bred, and catered to celebrity class. They do nothing. They add nothing. They go out and are basically a PR front for uh, British supremacy or whatever we want to call it. And, and, you know, I was writing about this earlier. It's not like white supremacy just suddenly cures itself. I mean, their wealth and their power and their influence is all built on white supremacy. And to hear that, you know, there are like parts of it in there, it, it kind of shows first and foremost how weird it is that we don't understand that these things are at the core of things, but also that like, the people who are white supremacists have learned so well not to say the things anymore, right? They, they, they It's when they get caught, it's when they slip up that the actual white supremacy uh, inherent in all this starts to come to the to the forefront. You had a lot of great observations on Twitter <laughs> last night at J.Y. Sexton, uh, one of which is the idea that the monarchy is hurt or helped by anything is just the... <laughs> Is just a side effect of the palace intrigue they provide, a sideshow that conceals the banal but awful means by which power and wealth are actually managed. I didn't read that very well, but uh, th you're saying that it doesn't th the news that we learned last night, the interpretation of Meghan and Harry doesn't hurt the royal family at all. And you go on to say, especially because they're a country that just passed Brexit and more. Yeah, did you see Pierce Morgan's reaction to it? Because I, I don't know about you, I was ready for Pierce's take. Yeah, I part of <laughs> me was like, I'm very much, I'm, I'm. It's sort of like fantasy football. I was sort of imagining what it was going to be, what parameters it was going to take, and like in my mind's eye, I sort of saw the graphs of the article. You know what I mean? Like I, it was sort of like Matrix time. I was like moving through it, and I was like, how is Pierce going to be as disgusting as possible? I watched a little of it. I couldn't stomach the whole thing. What 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 is what is I mean, what did he say that was so ridiculous or what do you make of the reaction to it in the UK and, and those who support the royal family? Well, a lot of what's going to happen and it is already starting to take shape today is is to even start talking about this. We have to talk about why the royals still exist. Right. Like why we, we even have a monarchy in place in, in Britain. And by the way, for for the record, she is not just the Queen of England. She's the Queen of Canada, 
Australia, other places around the world. Like the fact that this still exists is so upsetting and disturbing that we have to actually talk about why it exists. And the reason is because we still have a need for these old traditional sort of mythologies. You know what I mean? That have power. And it's really important while we're talking about this, we have to talk about a guy like Steve Bannon. This is all that Bannon's about. Bannon is about well, there is no mystery anymore. There's no esotericism, right? We're, we're living in like an anti-religious secular world. And so people like Bannon are saying, oh, the way to find power is through the power of symbolism and mythologies and past and legacies and all of this. So that's why they're there. That's why we're talking about things like Western civilization or, you know, we're uh, the other day, it's like we're talking about Nazi runes at CPAC, right? We're talking about about somehow or another going into the past and rediscovering these moments of power. That's what the British monarchy is all about. And we're seeing it today, which is that a bunch of white supremacist, white nationalist, um, British nationalist are flocking to protect the English monarchy because they have been exposed as being racist and white supremacist. But that means that they are now the cause celebre. Right. And for years, and, and I'm sure that you've seen your fair share of this, people were like, oh, I don't know how the British royal family is going to survive Diana and how they treated her. Or, oh, this new scandal with this prince or that prince or whatever. It's like, it doesn't matter. Yeah. And, uh, prince Andrew was accused of, of doing horrible things to underage girls. You're right. Go ahead. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Like that, like this whole thing, it's a pageant play. And I will say over the past four years with Trump, especially was a really wonderful uh, realization. And, And I don't know about you. I'm so relieved I don't have to read articles anymore about who's in and who's out in the Trump administration, who Trump likes this week, who Trump doesn't like this week. And it's all palace intrigue. And and the whole point is everything that we're talking about here, all of these passion plays, they are things to concern yourself with. That celebrity culture, it's stuff to uh, concern yourself with that doesn't mean anything. Yeah, and it well, completely I just want to obscure real power. Well, you mentioned about who's in and who's out of the the the, the, the Trump administration and, and being glad that we don't have to pay attention to that. But it was it was far deeper than that. And when you explain it, it makes sense to me. Like like average Americans who weren't very political kind of knew the cast. They knew who Kellyanne yeah. Conway was. They, they knew who Sarah Huckabee Sanders or Kaylee McEnany was like people knew who they were because they were constantly making noise and wrecking things and causing controversy. And then Trump's relationship with them. But you never knew so many players in an administration, obviously, that, that went in and out. And now you look at Joe Biden. We rarely talk about Joe Biden, much less the actual people in his administration. Most Americans couldn't probably name hardly any of them outside of the vice president and maybe a spokesman. And that's a major game change because media, because now we have to focus on, believe it or not, more important and consequential issues like the rescue bill or Dr. Seuss. (laughs) But what do you, what do you make of like the fact that the, that a, that Biden is in charge now. We have this yep. huge rescue bill that no Republican supported. And I think you you so cogently wrote it. Didn't this nobody's saying this, but you wrote this. Didn't <laughs> offer an alternative. That's Don't. super important when we talk about legislation, or frankly, when we talk about the off- the offense in a football game. Well, you don't want to run that play. Well, what play do you run on? I don't know, Dr. Seuss. The point being, that's the play they're running. During this COVID, during the rescue bill. What are they focused on? What is what has become of the Republican Party without Trump and their media without Trump? Yeah, I was writing about this the other day. We have to stop thinking about the Republican Party as an actual political party. Agreed. They have no they have no ideas. They have no ideology. They have no plans. And and I know that there's like been this influx of people who are paying attention to politics, particularly because Donald Trump was a threat and the rising tide of fascism was a threat. They need to understand in the past When something like this relief bill would have been put forward by the Democrats, the Republican Party would have come out with an alternative. They would have come out with some sort of a plan. And by the way, it wouldn't have been a real plan. It would have been a distraction. It would have been pushing their agenda and their platform. They didn't even bother with it this time. Kevin McCarthy put out a video of him reading Green Eggs and Ham because they have nothing left. This goes back to what we're talking about, the royal family and what it actually is. It's a sideshow. 
Because the Republicans have tried to turn American politics into a dog and pony show that people will talk about who's winning, who's losing. And it's like a spectacle for us. Well, it's all like The watch. Apprentice or The Desperate Housewives or all yeah. the things that, you know, we, we could have seen this coming when reality TV first started from Survivor and so on. That, that I, I remember just thinking long and hard as a comedian and someone who's really interested and supportive of scripted, you know, entertainment uh, art. If you will, it's like, what's happening? It's it's destroying everything that's good. And now it's destroyed politics. It's a, a reality show. Yeah, on, on and I mean, right. like, look at look at the people on the right who are now at the forefront of of the party, right? It's the people who, during a reality TV show, they would have like the most uh, like controversial side things. You know what I mean? Wherever the camera comes up and they're like, hey, I'm really going to screw him in this yeah. next, next challenge. Just wait for it, right? Or that was a lie that I told to do this. They're trolls. They are characters who only exist and are only powerful because they can best embody cultural rage and frustration. That's all they have. And they have no, again, they have no agenda. I mean, in 2020, they didn't even have a platform because they, there's no need for it. What they're interested in doing is dismantling government as public good. They want to make it to where government could never possibly make your life better because they are bought and sold by wealthy and powerful people who have no interest in government actually working. So I want to talk with you about uh, a bunch of things, obviously, always, Jared, but this the rescue bill itself, the anti-poverty heroes, as I call them, and organizations that I support and read, as well as the hard reporting and outlets like the New York Times, seem to say that the rescue bill is a very, very important uh, development in that specifically the thing that I want to celebrate and be very happy about is that it it goes a long way to bring down poverty, like a third. And this idea that if you have a child, many countries, Europe and Canada, you get money from the government. If you have a child, you automatically get government. That's in there temporarily, of course. So I just feel like it's a very important and consequential, and I guess you can call it progressive accomplishment. And there may be more. There, there may not be. We have to talk about how the United States Senate works, of course. But I wanted to get your take on the rescue bill, which is almost two trillion dollars in terms of what you know that it does and what you think about the achievement of its passing. I think it's an achievement. I think that's the important thing here. Um, I think I think the way that you look at American politics at this point, um, it is basically one long log jam of the government being made inconsequential or impotent on purpose with a few moments of actual achievements, actual things that can be passed or put through that will actually make lives better. Um, I want to point out, though, that it's really important that we also divide these achievements between two. One is reactive. This is because, of course, the pandemic occurred and it's created an economic and social political crisis. Something had to be done. Right. Somebody had to step up to the plate as responsible adults and do something. This was a reactive bill that is its own massive achievement. Now, it almost seems impossible. It feels like a Sisyphean task to push that boulder up a mountain to simply react to a crisis. What we need to be able to do is to change the political environment to start taking proactive steps. This, of course, poverty is a consequence of unequal uh, unequal economics and politics. We need to start making it more equal so we can even get beyond the idea of poverty and we can start actually bringing people up out of these terrible conditions. But I think it's a real, real start. And I think it's a laudable achievement for sure. That's good to hear. I'm glad that you're uh, that you're positive on it. And uh, what is, what is your outlook on the rest of, you know, this legislative, this Congress and, and what can get done? There does seem to be some developments. I don't know how close you're watching it, but with with Senator Joe Manchin, maybe opening it up to uh, allowing more bills to be passed, used uh, d- doing using reconciliation. I'm good at talking. It's a stupid word anyway. Uh, what do you think about the outlook uh, right now? With what else could get, get, get done? Man, you want to talk about passion plays and dog and pony shows. Yeah. I mean, Joe Manchin has his own WandaVision style spinoff at this point. I mean, he he is just an entity unto his own. Watching him try and navigate what he thinks is best for his political outlook and career while keeping America hostage more or less based on what he wants or what he thinks needs to happen. Somebody needs to get in his ear. 
Because this the, the next two years before we get to the midterms is going to determine whether or not he has leverage or whether or not he's going to have anything nearing the power that he has right now. The stuff that he... I, I don't know that he says he's against, but he, he wrings his hands over everything, Pete. The things that he is sort of concerned by, whether it's getting rid of the filibuster or putting out progressive legislation that would actually invest money into American lives, those are extremely popular. I'm talking like 70 to 80 percent, depending on the project. What he needs to understand and what somebody like a Schumer needs to communicate to him. And by the way, it's it's quite obvious that Schumer understands that the future is progressive. I mean, watching him sort of become more and more outwardly expressive of the idea of progressivism or activism through the Senate uh, has been pretty telling about where this thing is mm. going. Somebody needs to get in Manchin's ear and, and, and understand that, like, he can be a kingmaker in this entire situation. He can get a ton of credit for moving the country in a better direction simply because he gets on board with what is good for his political future. You know, I was watching, I watch like all the Sunday shows or I listen to them almost every Sunday. I've, I've had oh, this routine Pete, why? for the past several weeks. Yeah, I know. I'm glad you interrupted and said that because as I watch them, I think of people like you and how you would watch or listen to them. But <sighs> I, I, I do it because it's easy to do. Uh, and I and I like some of the guest experts that they have on, sure. you know, especially from government and so on. Like and even, a, you know, Chuck Todd does a great interview with Anthony Fauci, you know, like he doesn't do a good. In, he, he just invites the wrong people on and doesn't push them hard enough. But some of the things, you know, I, some of the things are good. Ali Valshi is great, by the way, on the weekend, Saturday and Sunday, two hours each Saturday and Sunday. But when I when I think about like you listening to it and I think about some of the straight journalists uh, in, in, in the NBC's and the CNN's, this is why I always get kind of uh, irked by people saying that CNN is is liberal or some of these corporate media outlets, even M NBC is liberal because we can we can pick and choose. But basically on those Sunday show panels, they're taking Republicans seriously again. And I hear people like you in my ear going, this is preposterous that the that the congressional reporter and NBC News is saying Republican voters are thinking it's like, no, no, they are. Anti-government white supremacists. Nope. And the only thing that matters that you should ask them is, do they think that the election outcome was legitimate? But other than that, nothing else matters. And until that is answered and, and answered correctly, then it does not matter what they think if you're a reporter, because all the rest of it is bullshit. I didn't articulate that very well. But what do you hear and see when you see that kind of congressional reporting and the taking of Republicans seriously? Well, I, I, I think you articulated it perfectly. I mean, like, it, it, it's hard to talk about it without just screaming bullshit at the top of your lungs. I mean, one of the major problems that's happened here, and I think that maybe this isn't something that we talk enough about, is the fact that politics, particularly the more and more that it's been bought off by wealthy and powerful interests, it has turned into a sport. It's turned into a game, which a lot of what you're talking about are DC insiders who are really they marvel at how the game is played. They're not worried about what happens with the politics. They don't worry necessarily about what the bills do. Matter of fact, they're not even based in reality. They're based in the narrative that is being bandied about between Democrats and Republicans. It just so happens that the Republican Party is in a complete alternate reality and a fascistic abyss at this point. That is still an actual valid viewpoint in that paradigm. Right. You've got to have people on. And even if they're going to tell you the election was stolen, even if they're going to tell you that Antifa is part of a giant conspiracy to, I don't know, plunge America into hell or whatever. Like that at this point is a narrative. And when you get on these major shows, the question is, will that narrative win or should we, I don't know, maybe have a bill that helps people out of poverty? And, and that's the honest to God current condition of America. And that's not a valid question. That's just a continuation of a, of, of a toxic paradigm that doesn't work. Last question for you today, because I know you got to go or I could talk to you for hours, is uh, regarding a tweet of yours, which I read this morning and really made me before I look into it and start reading history. I just want to ask you about it so I know what direction to go. But you wrote. An example of conventional and damaging historical narratives is the lie that the Red Scare was about fear of communism 
and not a concentrated effort to oppress African-Americans, women, LGBTQ, labor union, socialists, and dismantle the New Deal slash social safety net. I've not really ever heard that interpretation of, of history. I always really believe that the Red Scare was about the fear of communism, whether or not we should be as afraid of communism as they made us uh, believe to have all of these wars in, in Korea <laughs> and and uh, and Vietnam, of course, I, I've never bought into. But I never really heard it framed the way that you did. And I guess I've got some some reading to do. Yeah, it's a really weird thing when you start actually looking at the history of uh, the Red Scare, which is actually two periods in American history. Whenever you say it the first time, you just think about like the 1950s, right, with McCarthyism or whatever. The first Red Scare was actually post-World War I. And what actually happens post-World War I is you have uh, African-Americans who are suddenly scapegoated in a conspiracy theory that they are working with communists to uh, disrupt America. Right. Because you have a bunch of like black soldiers who come back and want, I don't know, rights and civil liberties. And you actually start seeing things like The New York Times start running articles about how like uh, the reds and the blacks are working together. That leads to, of course, a bunch of race riots. It leads to a bunch of oppression. It leads to lynching, all this stuff. That takes place for a while with a very specific intent, which is to oppress African-Americans. Get to the 1950s, you got to dismantle FDR's New Deal somehow. It's incredibly popular. It's making it where labor is suddenly going more and more towards labor unions and suddenly more and more towards the people. All of a sudden, they start using that. You also have the Lavender Scare, which is where LGBTQ Americans are ferreted out of public service. They're hunted down. Uh, and, And of course, this entire thing is based on the idea of rolling back any liberal or progressive gains that you might have had with that with FDR. And it was a really intentional thing. But conventional history tells us America just woke up one day and they're like, my God, communists, we got to do something. But it was definitely a concerted effort. Uh, all right. Well, uh, I've got to find out what more to read, obviously, outside of, uh, of your great work on this, because I, I really wasn't uh, so much still to learn. And I always appreciate you joining me to teach me much of it. Thank you very much for joining me as always, buddy. I really appreciate it. Thanks, brother. All right. There goes Jared Yates Sexton. Follow him right now on Twitter at JY Sexton. If you haven't bought his book, American Rule, do that now as well. Subscribe to his podcast, the Muckrake Podcast, and look for more from Jared and I together. We're always talking about how we can work together more. I uh, always love talking to Jared Yates Sexton. Please tell him you enjoyed Hearing that conversation it means so much to me, to those of you who regularly do. Thank you, Kim and Tina and so many other people who are promoting the show for me on Twitter and social media. I love you guys. I really, really appreciate it and need that support. I didn't push the subscription either. Uh, I can't do this podcast without you. So while it's free, it ain't cheap. I spend a lot of time every week doing it five days a week, producing a podcast that usually takes five people doing it all alone in the solar powered shed and i really really appreciate your support so go to the paid subscription link or patreon.com slash pete dominic right now and sign up for a paid subscription join us thursday nights live for the stand-up happy hour hangout every thursday at 8 p.m all right now let me get to my second guest of the show we're twitter twitter friends and Uh, fond of each other's tweets and she's a very smart woman who's a political scientist and postdoctoral scholar at the Fielding School of Public Health at the University of California in Los Angeles. She's an expert on healthcare and health policy. She got her PhD in political science at Columbia. I go through actually a little bit of her background here at the top of the show because it's uh, her first time on the program. Well, we get to it at some point in the in the conversation. I forget when because we taped earlier. But my conversation now with a really funny uh, woman who uh, I'm, I'm so happy to bring on the show for the first time, Dr. Miranda Yaver. And she is also, by the way, on Twitter at and really great on Twitter, a great follow on Twitter. Really funny, really smart at Miranda Yaver. Did I say Yaver at Miranda Yaver? on Twitter, and here we go. Okay, there she is, Dr. Miranda Yaver. Not Yaver, but when you read it on Twitter where you're very popular, I think people probably say and have said your whole life Yaver. It must be quite a burden. 
Especially when, you know, I'm being called professor or Dr. Yaver, you know, it's just my, I'm known by my last name, but I roll with, I, roll, I go with the flow. It's fine. Well, I'm very excited to have you joining me for the first time here. We've been uh, Twitter uh, followers, friends, and I love reading your, your tweets and Likewise. I'm very happy to have you joining me on the show for the first time. Lots to discuss, but first you are a very educated person. You have uh, gone to a bunch of different institutions that are impressive and taught and been a professor at a bunch of institutions. Could you take me through a little bit of, of your background just to uh, impress and blow the mind of my audience as to where it all started for you? Sure. Uh, so I went to UC Berkeley, go Bears. Um, graduated with honors in political science. And then I did some coursework at the University of Virginia, then did my PhD in political science at Columbia, focusing on American politics and quantitative methodology. So basically doing quantitative research on American politics and public policy. And then I uh, was a Hold professor. On. Mm -hmm. I get to ask a question. What does that mean? Sure. Quantitative uh, studies on whatever you said. I don't even know how to repeat it. It's too high drop. I do statistical analysis of of political data, basically. Um, a lot of which I I gather myself. So it's, it's my cat's just. Oh my gosh! In. Your cat just <laughs> ran across the table. That was awesome. And and your cat like made a meow as well, almost as if it knew it was on. That was amazing. Bring it back. Okay, so so. All right, I interrupted you on what Columbia. So what? What's next? I did a postdoctoral fellowship at the Was at Washington University in St. Louis, and then I was teaching at Yale and Tufts universities, and I'm currently a research fellow at UCLA. You've taught a lot of different courses, and and your expertise is pretty uh, far and wide. Is there something that right now with where America is at that you're more focused on, more interested in? Obviously, you're you're still teaching uh, quite a, diff a few different courses and writing, but is is there is there one issue or subject that you're most focused on right now? Yeah. So in my research, I've been doing survey research on claimed on medical claim denials and the ways in which it deepens health inequality. So a lot of us you know, have private insurance and we we have sometimes dealt with with getting that dreaded note in the mail saying that a claim wasn't covered and thinking about who is most vulnerable to to being denied medical claims, who appeals and who doesn't because they're sort of intimidated by the healthcare bureaucracy. And do people postpone care in the aftermath because they're like, this was a pain in the ass. I don't even want to risk getting denied again. And surprise, surprise, people who are in who are higher economic socioeconomic status are more likely to appeal denied claims, more likely to be successful in doing so. Um, so it really has this effect of, of not just being this pervasive insurance practice, but deepening inequality among people who are poorer or in worse health. How does that that type of issue play out in, in other countries, say Canada, Israel or Australia or Japan. I mean, they, do they have similar issues with denying cl and claims for, for care? Well, I think it's different in the United States because we have a very profit motivated healthcare system. And yeah. so if people, if, if an insurance company whose staff are not physicians, um, who, their, their claims, you know, their, the people who are just dealing with processing claims don't see a pro, you know, sort of look at the price tag of something. They're w very willing to second guess the judgment of physicians who have prescribed various treatments. Oh. And um, it's really, it's an unfortunate practice. So you're also a stand-up comedian and political scientist. And so I, I just have to ask you what you think of all of these comedians that are hosting podcasts about politics. And you, you understand where they're coming from. You understand that yeah. whole whole world. And you're I mean, do you just do you just laugh at them all? Are they do you take anybody seriously? Is anybody I mean, just everybody thinks that they're an expert, yet you are actually an expert. I think that there's a lot of room for people to develop expertise and interests. So I don't think anyone has a monopoly on information. I disagree with you. I think that <laughs> you're wrong about that. I think you have a much more information than most of these people that are just yapping away, not only on podcasts and comedians, but but uh, across the kind of cable news platform, because I feel yeah. like you're someone I feel like you're someone or political scientists or or frankly, anybody who studies policy, carries out policy, works in government. You understand the gray areas, the nuance, the, the, yeah. the, 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 the how many things have to happen for something to work for to not work. But media, which you also understand, narrows it down to good and bad. Everything's binary, right and wrong. And we could probably you and I could probably name any issue and talk about the way that it's been 
watered down and, and, and yeah. demagogued. So well, there's an incentive to have sort of the sound bite, especially when you're talking about cable news. And and that frustrates me. And there there are definitely guests that I wish people like MSNBC would, wouldn't book. Michael Moore comes to mind. Um, uh, he's, but... he's done. He's done. I mean, his last. Did you yeah. see that tweet about Texas? Yeah, that was in, that was infuriating. And his um, dumb climate change I, doc that he produced. I mean, there's there's a lot of blame to go around with Texas politicians, but I don't think that Texas voters they should be held accountable in a deadly yeah. pandemic for yeah. you know a choice that they made when that's they're what Michael Moore was basically <laughs> saying for people who didn't see the tweet. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, just staying on that, do you do you watch any of those shows in in any way? And if you do, do you just wanna? go crazy because it's so frustrating to hear how minimized they make such difficult, complex issues. I, so I, I watched a little bit of cable news. I used to watch it a lot and I felt like I wasn't getting a whole lot of value out of it. I felt like the main thing it was doing was sort of catharsis because I could see some people who were like-minded, you know, getting, getting pissed off about the same things that keep me up at night. But, but I, I wish that they booked more political scientists on, on the cable shows because I think that we, you know, we can talk about things that there's so one, one good example that I can think of was Tom Steyer was, campaigning on wanting to have term limits, which every political scientist will say is a terrible idea um, because they it, um, it dampens expertise in Congress and it exacerbates the revolving door with lobbyists because people, members of Congress are then just going to be looking to their next opportunity. But there weren't political scientists, you know, on the cable shows who are pushing back on these assertions that political scientists have investigated. So so in those kinds of contexts, I get really um, frustrated with it to it. The limits of the reliance on experts. Yeah, I mean, there is a, a huge limit on expertise. I think certain networks, certain shows have, have gotten much better at it. But th- that doesn't matter because if you're talking to someone who is a scientist or physician, it's still three minutes. It doesn't matter yeah. how good of an interview it is. It's three to six minutes or something like that. And it's just you just can't get enough to make a decision to form an opinion from most of those segments. And it's all driv- driven by ratings and, and advertisers, which is why that it, it's it's the way it works, which is why I prefer a long form conversation here. I mean, that, those are my thoughts on it. I mean, being someone who's been done a lot of those segments, it's just like it sound bites. like I yeah. can sound as smart as you in two minutes. And I have an <laughs> associate's degree, but on minute three, I'm out. <laughs> I mean, that, that's the truth yeah, of it all. I mean, as long as you can write up some bullet points, you're good to go in those kinds of segments. Yeah. Make them snappy and make sure. I mean, you literally have someone in your ear going rap, rap. And you're like, I haven't even started <laughs> examining this policy. So let me ask you, staying on the healthcare issue, we're a year into the pandemic. And I wonder if anything that has happened has really surprised you at all. Miranda, because, I mean, you you understand so much about vulnerable communities and marginalized folks and how much more difficult it is for them. You knew, I'm sure, when this began that they were going to suffer the most. most, And that, of course, is what has happened. But has anything surprised you in terms of it's been worse than you thought it would be or there are you know rays of hope yeah so so i i'll admit that it took me probably longer than it should have to realize how enduring this pandemic is going to be i think this time last year i was thinking i i mean i didn't even clean out my office i was just like i'll be back here in three weeks four weeks something like that so so i certainly underestimated the extent to which to which this was going to go on you know thankfully you know i gotten my first shot and uh, you know people are getting vaccinated and that's that's always reason for hope one thing that I'm really hoping that this provides I'm not sure that it will but I'm hoping is that you know a lot of people lost their and their jobs because of because of covid and a lot of people's health insurance is tied to their jobs and so what I'm hoping that this does is renew the conversation about the extent to which it still makes sense to have empl- health insurance tied to employment when we're dealing with devastating economic impacts caused by a pandemic that was no one's fault. And I don't even really like to use the word fault because there are people who get laid off and it's not their fault. It's because of other economic factors and, and employer decisions. But but I'm hoping that that this will fuel some some renewed debate over health care reform. Do you think it will, though? 
I'm not optimistic, but I mean, I, I you know, it's, it's my, it's my hope. I, I don't know that I would place any financial bets on, on it actually happening. But, you know, I think that, I think that President Biden has, has done a good job so far. And I think that, I do think that the Supreme Court is going to uphold the constitutionality of the Affordable Care Act. So I'm, I'm optimistic about, about sort of the, the pending litigation. I think that, um, yeah, it would be nice to see that people stop trying to sabotage the act, but but you know Republicans are going to Republican. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, your expertise also lies in con- constitutional law and, and public health. So a great person to talk to about uh, the actual lawsuit and, and and you know what you predict the outcome would be. But I'm glad to hear you say that. I'm not sure exactly which argument they're they're bringing up next, but there's no doubt with the makeup of the court now, conservatives will bring up another lawsuit against Obamacare, yeah. which is surprising. I mean, there's yeah. one in the works, right? Yeah. So the Supreme Court heard the argument in November and basically the argument. So the mandate was um, in in National Federation versus uh, of independent business versus Sibelius. The Supreme Court said that the mandate was constitutional as a tax uh, because it was collected by the IRS. But then in um, in 2017, in the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, the the Congress um, made it a zero dollar penalty uh, for the mandate. And so then the question is, if is it still a tax if it's if it's a tax of zero dollars, essentially? Right. And um, and then if the if we take out the mandate, can the rest of the, the law um, uh, be left intact because it doesn't have what's called a severability clause. So um, so basically the Republicans are arguing that because the Affordable Care Act doesn't have a, a severability clause, if we take out the mandate, then the rest of the act needs to be held unconstitutional. I think that what that's going to happen is the Supreme Court is going to say that the mandate is the zero dollar mandate is unconstitutional, but the rest of the law is still valid. Well, and I would I would place a lot of money on that. Bed. Oh, good. Well, I hope you're right about that, uh, because otherwise, well, my family is going to be in trouble. And so will uh, millions of others. Yeah, I mean, millions. Have you uh, have you, uh, are you familiar with Jonathan Cohn? Yes, I really love his work. Yeah, he's got a great new book out, but which if you haven't read it yet, uh, the 10 year war about Obamacare and 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 the fight for universal care in the United States of America. And I wanted to ask you about where you thought we are at, uh, given the fact that the Affordable Care Act has been implemented for years now and Medicaid expansion still not in in every state, which is just so crazy and very yeah. maddeningly frustrating because States could could cover more of their people with health insurance for free and the federal government would pay for it, but they just don't do it. These uh, handful of red states that are still holding out, you know, and but other than that, I mean, it feels like a lot of of parts of that bill and a lot of the regulations on the insurance companies, et cetera, have really been very effective. And I want to know what your thoughts are on it. Yeah, I mean, we've seen that people are more likely to be able to have a primary care doctor. They're less likely to have unmet health needs. They're more, they're more likely to able to you know be able to afford care with the ACA and with Medicaid expansion. We've seen that health outcomes improve. The people's ability to access care improves. I can even say from personal experience, when I was between jobs, I relied on on Connecticut's Medicaid expansion when I was living in New, in New Haven, and it was and it was a game changer for me because I have a few pre-existing conditions. It's been a delight in the COVID pandemic you know, as far as anxiety, managing anxiety goes. So, you know, it would, I think that if a state hasn't, you know, pursued Medicaid expansion seriously by now, you know, and there are, I think, 12 states, I think there are 12 holdouts, you know, it's, it's certainly disappointing. You know, the Supreme Court has said that they can't compel Medicaid expansion. So it is still discretionary. It would be, I, I think that the reds the fact that there are red states that have expanded medicaid shows that you know this is yeah. this is really just about you're essentially getting free money to help poor people some might even say it's the christian thing to do uh, um, yeah and then you look at a state like i think texas is the biggest state that hasn't accepted a expansion also i think the highest it used to be at least the highest percentage of uninsured citizens in texas and 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 they have a fix and they don't take it and it's just needless suffering and it's, and it's exacerbated by the covid pandemic true. because people have lost people have lost jobs related to to the pandemic or even if they have lost jobs some of them have lost hours which might have affected you know whether they have to rely on the subsidies versus what could would otherwise qualify for medicaid expansion depending on on where their income level is yeah. and so what do you think of uh, of this rescue package almost two trillion dollars and i mean i feel like it's not getting nearly enough 
positive attention based on what I've read. I, I read a sentence that said it goes, it does more to fight poverty, cuts like, was it childhood poverty? Uh, in one third, it cuts it in one third. It's got these payments to, you know, to, to families with kids, which so many other countries do for all families all the every year. And yeah. so this is temporary, but still, I feel like this is quite a triumph. And we can talk about what might come next, given our stupid United States Senate, which you can speak to. But I, I just want to know what your thoughts are on the rescue package and it getting close to done. I guess it goes back to the House now. Yeah, I, I, I agree with your assessment that it's not getting nearly enough positive coverage. I mean, you, they, there's a graph that's been circulating that shows the distribution of benefits across income levels, comparing the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act to to this COVID relief package. And you can see the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, the benefits were overwhelmingly to the wealthy. And here it's overwhelmingly to the people who actually need it. And and I think that, that that's a really good sign that, that it's a well-designed policy aimed at, at helping people who are struggling as yeah. a result of this pandemic. Yeah, Trump and Republicans gave money to people who didn't need it and they yeah. saved it. And and Biden and Democrats. And they have the same price tag. And it's just like if you're upset about the two million dollars being two trillion dollars being spent by the government, maybe you should have tuned in to when the when the government was spending two trillion dollars on tax cuts that were unnecessary. And the other, I think, undercovered. I don't know how you look at it. Maybe you have a thoughtful way of looking at it, but it's like there's political Twitter and, and nerds like us that pay close attention to day to day news, policy moving, you know, legislation, as well as, you know, even grassroots uh, activists and in, in, in different movements to, to kind of see where where things might go. Not mm-hmm. to mention election campaigns are going on all the time. And and so we pay close attention to these things. But I think, you know, you've been tweeting a lot about this and and and, and another reason to follow you on Twitter. And hopefully everybody is. But uh, it's the voter suppression and yeah. several new laws being passed. Everybody's focused on Georgia right now. And uh, you you shared this tweet. I got to find it. It was so perfect. This guy wrote that you retweeted about. Oh, it, was, it was Anthony Christ's tweet of the, about the racism and the, uh, and the royal family. Wait till you hear about Georgia, essentially. Yeah, wait till you hear about how many. Yeah, the 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 laws that they are passing in Georgia. So I my point is, I feel like these voter suppression laws making it harder for people to vote uh including republicans by the way but it's you know it's it's a game they think is worth playing is the most important most undercovered issue because again finally we know it we see it but the vast majority of americans have no idea that this stuff is happening and aren't paying attention to this kind of granular detail most of the time and it's important to emphasize that political scientists have studied the pervasiveness of, of, of voter fraud, and they found that out of about a billion votes cast, there were 35 credible instances of in-person voter fraud, 35 out of a billion. So this is, you know, we can talk all we want about election integrity, but we're really um, doing a um, you know, very racially motivated attack to solve a problem that doesn't exist. Well, the problem that exists is people of color voting. Right, right. <laughs> That's the problem that exists. Yeah, it's trying to solve a problem that doesn't exist. But so many people buy this stuff. You and I were talking uh, earlier on the phone about this. How Some of your young students see this and say, well, this what, what's the problem? You should have to have an ID for voting. We've been hearing these arguments for years now. They're so convincing to people. What do you say? I would say it's really hard to get Americans to show up to vote once. <laughs> and it's, you know, the idea that someone is going to is going to try to cast multiple ballots is just inconsistent with what we know to be true. We fight tooth and nail to get people to show up to to show up to vote. Um as in, to fulfill their civic duty. And um, so the idea that people would um, would line up, vote, then get back in line somewhere and, li- you know, stay, wait in line and vote again to cast what is ultimately probably not going to be a highly consequential ballot because it's very difficult to become the pivotal voter. You know, there, there just isn't really, a, you know, it, it wouldn't be a rational action. Exactly. But yet it's happening. What do you make of these uh, bills that are moving their way through Congress to restore voting rights that were gutted by the Supreme Court? Will that even work? 
So basically, so what the Supreme Court did in Shelby County versus Holder was they uh, they got rid of the formula according to which uh, according to which uh, states have to petition the Department of Justice uh, for what's called preclearance. Essentially, they ha- they have to get the Department of Justice authorization to pass various voting restrictions. And so, you know, I haven't I haven't followed I've been following Georgia more closely than than what's going on at, at the national level. But I think that um, voting rights have to be a significant priority if we're going to get anything done because um you know having a free and fair election is you know essential to democracy and when you have one party that is literally just trying to make it more difficult for poor people and people of color to vote that's um that's really undermining the extent to which we can say that we have a a true democracy yeah well said i mean i I always say to people you know we we have this question i am actually i think i'm open to this conversation with when when people say they're clearly bigoted or ignorant or even racist and they say well i'm not racist and they go on defending themselves and i have these uh, comical threshold tests that I that I uh, use with people. But my new one is there's nothing really more racist than uh, purposely trying to restrict a certain color person from voting. Like That's yeah. it. Like if you're creating restrictions and obstacles on, on people voting and you're not making it easier in voting, that's a racist policy. I mean, it's, yeah. it's to me, it's the most obvious slam dunk convincing one. But of course, they'll say. It's not that hard. It's not that hard to to vote. It's not, you know, it's not racist. It's not that difficult. How can you say that? And then except that we know that, you know, DMVs are not always open. People who have who work on an hourly wage, but then have to take time off from their hourly wage. And so their opportunity costs. We know that the ability to if, if it isn't being if it isn't the ID isn't being made free, then, you know, we could even consider it as a poll tax, essentially, if if an if an ID is, is required. But- but I feel like we need to go back. I mean, that's why it's great that they're calling it the John Lewis Act. And it's why, of course, John Lewis was appalled by the, the, the Supreme Court decision that gutted the Voting Rights Act, which, of course, he fought and almost died for. And so many others did. And and I, I think we're in, it's easy to just talk to people to just go back and look at history and, and, and understand that it was a stated goal by white Southern folks for generations stated goal to prevent black people from voting and before that prevent them from becoming literate much less educated because they knew once they got the right to vote they would want other rights and unfortunately white folks or generations have thought that that takes something from them but i just want to be clear to folks and, and 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 see what your thoughts are on history the the outspoken goal to restrict black people's rights to vote this is not new it's no, a little bit all. more subtle but it's always been the strategy to prevent black people from voting. I was just re-watching mississippi burning which plenty of people apparently have problems with but i mean in the movie the guy's like something about you know black people are never going to get the right to vote here i mean it was, yeah. it was it's always i mean it's just a movie but it's always been a clear strategy is what i'm trying to say Right. Well, Ch- Cheney, Goodman, and Schwerner were killed because they were had the audacity to be registering African Americans to vote in the South, and you know we know that um, that yeah these these tactics are are far from new. People aren't getting lynched in you know in the same way for for trying to register to vote or trying to vote, but the tactics of very clearly. Um, identifying who is going to, you know, um, who can, who essentially has the luxury of voting, who, who is able to, to access the ballot and knowing that there are significant disparate impacts on poor people and people of color. Um, you know, this, this would, the tactics that are going on now would have made the segregationists of the 1950s and 1960s very content. <laughs> uh, how do you see today's Republican Party? I try not to. (laughs) (laughs) You can't look um, away. You have to. Yeah. No, it's, uh, it's, it's very scary because, um, they're not grounded in facts and they're really, um, you know, it's, it's hard, it's hard to have an argument with, with people in the Republican party now because they don't, they don't care about facts and they don't care about decency. 
Um, and you know, it's, it's hard to have an argument that it, that isn't fact based. There's really, it feels like it's still very much tied to president Trump. Um, even though he is no longer in office, you know, there's, there really hasn't been a reset button and they haven't really had the willingness or interest or, you know, uh, to have a real, um, you know, the reflection on on the insurrection and their willingness to to allow people to believe that it was not a free and fair election, which again comes back to their views on voting. Um, and so, when you have one party that is not uniformly committed to saying this was a free and fair election, we lost. Better luck next time. You know that's how it's supposed to work. Um, you know, it's hard to, you know, it, it's hard to see the party as standing for American democracy and in a healthy system. I want to have a healthy two party system where both parties care about democracy, agree on the rules of the game and just have very different policy visions for how to get it done. But that just doesn't feel like the world we're living in right now. Yeah. Very different policy visions. I mean, can you I mean, honestly, understand what the policy visions are for the modern day Republican Party, because I mean, for the last decade or most of our lives, they've been fairly clear on what their platform was and what their policy agenda has been. But my interpretation now is it's all driven by personality and anything yeah. that mattered in the past doesn't matter. It's now a cult party. And and by the way, I mean, you, know, you I think you thought that Trump losing, going away and losing his Twitter I first of all, I think that's huge, and I think it has a, a major, major impact. But it is surprising that people like Lindsey Graham and others, uh, Republicans in the House, much less media stars, are still loyal to Donald Trump, yeah. who's a loser. He lost, and that's never yeah. happened in American politics. And I'm not sure what their agenda is now. <laughs> There, I mean, they haven't they haven't given up on trying to control women's bodies or going after the LGBT community or people of color. I mean, there there are certain staples of the Republican Party yeah. agenda that they're not giving up on. But um, but if they there have been a number of, of Republican um, or, of Republican members of Congress who have said it's the party of Trump. And um, and, you know, when I saw, you know, the images in CPAC of 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 some basically just hero worshiping president trump and uh and I, I just don't think that that's a healthy um healthy way to run a political party i think yeah they, um, they don't seem to they, they want to punish people uh for sure uh and control people to some extent but they don't seem to like they want to solve any problems they don't see no. the problem the problems that they it's crazy how much we have to talk about quote cancel culture <laughs> I'm happy to have the discussion about it. I think there are some issues that I'm happy to talk yeah. about, but I don't think it's in the top 20 issues in American no. culture or, or, I mean, and the people that are, you know, it's always interesting to me. I I mean, especially one of the things that I find so amusing is that, you know, they're trying to pin cancel culture on the Democrats, but they, but overwhelmingly it's been private companies decisions. And, you know, last I checked, Republicans have been very much prioritizing giving private companies the, the, a lot of discretion over who, for example, who they serve um, at their businesses. And so it's also, it's, it's also funny that they've been trying to pin it on the Democrats because it's like we don't you know Democrats don't control social media they don't control publishing companies you know things like that I feel like cancel culture is an issue that the privileged and fortunate are lucky to be complaining about like I just don't yeah. hear anybody to, that is struggling to pay their bills or has uh, yeah. some kind of health you know uh, chronic health care issue or you know any number of other realistic issues is is really concerned about. I mean, we're talking democracy, climate change, COVID, um, ac <laughs> yeah, COVID access to health care, averting nuclear war. I mean, I could recession. Name, yeah, <laughs> so many different economic issues. What is can where is cancel culture in that discussion? It really does seem to be a luxury of folks who don't have anything else to really be concerned with. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, if you're worried about putting food on the table, if you're worried about whether you have to choose between groceries and prescription drugs, you're not thinking about whether Dr. Seuss got canceled. It seems like a media star thing, too. Like, no, no, no right wing conservative is at his job 
really being worried about being can he's not worried about being canceled. Yeah. This is something that anyone from Sean Hannity to Bill Maher is complaining about. Yeah. I mean, the idea that people can go on Fox News and complain about being silenced when they're on a top three, you know, you right. know, broadcast network is is ridiculous. Well, sounds like we agree on that. Just not being much of an issue, but certainly, I mean, I, I can't think of anything else that's got a more disproportionate amount of attention for such a sustained period of time than yeah. this stupid argument, which doesn't rise to the level of any of the other issues that. You have studied for sure. I mean, <laughs> and there are also, you know, I've, I've joked that, you know, there, if cancel culture were as effective as some people are making it out to be, why is Jim Jordan still in Congress? Yeah. You know? Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Um, before we wrap it up, just wanted to ask a little bit about you and, and I'm trying to, uh, I've threatened to write a book for years uh, uh, for, for men, for parenting, uh, for for men who have daughters, girl dads, as they're now called, because I have two daughters and the book is from the point of view of, of other women. So I taught the women who I think are impressive, successful, um, you know, have done a lot in their lives and and asked them about uh, their lives and, and their folks and their and, and where they came from. And uh, you and I were talking and I just thought it was very interesting that both your parents growing up worked for nonprofits and, and, and cared deeply about issues, you know, helping other folks. And, and, and that clearly shaped you. Tell me a little bit about w- w- your mom and dad and, and how that affected you as a child, because you had some pretty unique experiences that I certainly wasn't having. Yeah. So my mom worked for the United Way of the Bay Area. And so I grew up helping out at homeless shelters and food banks. And um, my dad, and then she worked for the League of Conservation Voters. And my dad was at Planned Parenthood and, and Sierra Club. And so um, and it's kind of funny that they were on these tracks because they, they got divorced when I was five, but they both stayed in this very progressive nonprofit um, communities. And, and my mom's mom worked for the governor of California, George Duke Majin. And so, and when I was in high school, I would basically Im- immediately go off to, to go to political meetings and write letters to Iowa and New Hampshire voters telling them to vote for my preferred candidates. And so, um, so I was really shaped early on by the importance of, of political engagement. I remember one of my earlier political memories was um, I was about six years old when Bill Clinton won the presidency and I was running around my elementary school informing everyone that Bill Clinton had won. And I didn't exactly know what it meant, but I knew it was a I could tell it was a really good thing. And, and I also grew up with health issues and, I think um, because I had seen the and the band played on um, film that HBO had had produced the adaptation of Randy Schultz book. I was also formed, had had a lot of early opinions about health policy and realizing how political access to care is, even though in my view, it shouldn't be, but it, but it certainly is. So, so from, from health stuff to, to growing up in the nonprofit and and political campaigns uh, worlds, I think it was, was sort of destined that I was going to be a poli sci major at Berkeley. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you, you didn't. Well, and you've also uh, done a lot of comedy too. I guess that that, that wasn't necessarily predictive, but and, and, probably not. But teaching is teaching is performative, and if you, right. if you want nineteen year olds to care about what you have to say at nine a.m., you got to make them laugh. So how would you? How I mean, I know it's it's not fair to ask a, a college professor or anybody to generalize about a whole generation of, of young folks in this case, but. Is there anything that you feel comfortable saying? I mean, you've worked at Ivy League schools. You've worked at state schools. You've seen all different kinds of socioeconomic backgrounds um, over your over your career. But I mean, is there anything I always get irked when people talk about generation? This is that I'm like, come on. It's so general. And it's maybe, you know, some truth. Is there anything that you can say certainly about, you know, the the, the students who who are pursuing education in the courses that you're studying there? I would imagine more engaged generally speaking, but like, do we have a whole bunch of conspiracy theorists and white supremacists coming up? Not in my impression. Um, I have found this, this generation of students to be quite progressive, quite engaged. Um, You know, I don't, I, you know, I, 
I haven't really found, and it's what's interesting is that I haven't really found a big difference in that pattern between you know, private school and state school. I think that, that in the states, you know, schools, there's more of an understanding of what's at stake, um, I think, uh, with respect to economic inequality and racial inequality and other forms of, of justice. Um, but I, th- I have noticed that there has been a tremendous amount of political engagement, political and social engagement. Um, and and my, among my students over the last few years, um, really, you know, it's, pretty much every word that I've taught. And so whether I'm talking about the Merrick Garland here, so I, I was teaching law and public policy and constitutional law under Donald Trump. And I was also teaching on Congress during the, during the Brett Kavanaugh hearing. Wow. And so there was, there was a lot going on. Uh, the Mueller report dropped the day that I was already scheduled to teach on um, US v. Nixon. Um, uh, on executive privilege issues, and so it was. It was sort of this wild ride, and my students were were really, um, really riled up about about Brett Kavanaugh. And so that was that. We had a lot of really interesting discussions, some of which got emotional, but a lot of which were also grounded in, in Congress and law. Um, they've been very um, engaged in. I can tell that they based on when I've asked them about issues of student speech, for example, they've talked about their experience doing walkouts over gun violence or black lives matter protests. And so it's been, it's been really encouraging. You know, I, I, don't have a partisan hat when I'm teaching. I play devil's advocate. I'll put on my Scalia hat or my Clarence Thomas hat when, when I need to. And the um, Scalia hat is the one with the horns. It's like the Q shaman. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I'm not sure he was a great writer, but I, I disagreed with him strongly, as you might imagine. <laughs> um, but uh, the Clarence Thomas hat, it'd be very quiet because he doesn't talk a whole lot. <laughs> but um, yeah, so I mean, I, I play devil's advocate. I, I sort of push my students in each direction but but i'm i'm always really encouraged when i see this kind of activism i had some students um who wanted help writing an op-ed um about an up-and-coming presidential candidate who i didn't think had any chance um in hell to get ahead but i i reviewed it and i was i i you know gave them some tips and this candidate by the way was pete Buttigieg. Wow. <laughs> and so it's just like okay went on to win the iowa caucus okay i'm gonna shut my mouth when i see up and coming uh up and coming candidates so you're telling me <laughs> political on. scientists get their political uh, analysis wrong sometimes prognosis wrong? We, we do no i yeah we absolutely do no i i do not have the best track record with primary candidates so in 2004 i started with dean and then i went to edwards and then i went to clark and then i I went oh, wow. to to carry and then in 2008 i voted for hillary clinton in 2016 i voted for hillary clinton both times and then in 2020 i i sort of meandered i started off with kamala and then went to cory booker and then amy klobuchar and then biden i can't believe but, you skipped elizabeth warren why <laughs> I, I really liked her i didn't think that her health plan had a shot um hmm. and um I think that if I could wave a magic wand and make her president, I think that I, I probably would have and, and, and had a Democratic Senate. I think I would have put her in office, but I just I was wasn't confident that she could win. And I didn't have faith that her health plan was going to get enough votes were, instead. Were you shocked uh, the morning after the 2016 election when Donald Trump was elected president or were you pretty were you concerned and thought it might happen? Um, so I was at the Hillary official party at the, at the Javits Center. So I, I don't think I would have gone to that if I thought that Trump was going to win. I, my odds, I, w- I was more cautious than I think a lot of Democrats were. Um, the next day I had to teach on statistics and in, in political science. And I, I that day I had taught on, um, oh. on election day, I had taught on like the methodology behind 538. <laughs> so <laughs> and like my last screen, my last slide of the class was the screenshot of, you know, 75 percent chance of clinton um wow. so i was i, I was spent a that whole day drinking yeah i um i came up with the brilliant idea to have a shot of bourbon for every battleground state called contrary to my preferences oh dear <laughs> but, I'm, <laughs> but i'm still alive so it's it's fine my liver is intact um but uh, uh and then i sort of meandered back to grand central station to go home and that was crying and one of the cops was like are you okay i was like the world is not okay <laughs> oh my god he was probably like i love it 
Because he's a cop and I have problems. Okay, so finally, <laughs> before we go, I wanted to ask you, you know, you wrote this really intimate, heartfelt piece during the Brett Kavanaugh hearings uh, uh, titled Why I Didn't Report, a uh, heart-wrenching piece to read and at Medium that I, I hope everybody will, will consider reading because it's uh, very important, I think, to, to read folks' account of sexual assault and rape about two times in mm-hmm. your life that you had been raped. Why did you write that? I wrote it because I felt that there were a lot of members of the Senate who were discrediting um, discrediting sexual assault as an issue and really reinforcing this point of why why didn't she report if if why would she come forward now instead of then and there are a lot of reasons why women don't report sexual assault sometimes it's just really traumatizing and you don't want to to deal with it sometimes you just want to move on with your life um and i don't think that that one can infer credibility or lack thereof because the report was late and it was just really infuriating to watch so many members of the senate just treating this this hearing as a chore or just or an opportunity to score political points by um by trying to discredit um a sexual assault survivor and so um i just felt like you know telling my story as people as many people were telling their stories um wanted to add this this perspective to the because I was very dissuaded from from reporting um, the assaults that I By that I experienced. Um, the, when I went to the campus health center, the first question that they asked was uh, whether I'd been drinking, mm. and not was I okay? Was I injured? Um, you know, did I have the name of you know? Could I identify the person who did it? It was just well, were you drinking? And so that. Um, was just a really demoralizing position to to be put in just a couple of days after that, and and so um, so I didn't end up didn't end up see, you know pursuing anything. I just went to therapy essentially. Mm. Uh, it's a it's a really important piece to read. I highly recommend folks read it. It's uh, unfortunately always relevant, and uh, right now we're 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 witnessing. Uh, what's happening with Andrew Cuomo. Do you have any thoughts on that? Are you, th- there's a couple different camps, but you know, um, people say, let there be an investigation. That's certainly what he wants. He wants mm-hmm. to try to ride this out, but I don't know. To me, once there's more than a couple of, uh, of people accusing you of a certain behavior, as you just said, it takes a tremendous amount of courage. Nobody wins. Uh, the, the, the people who make the allegations are destroyed and are threatened. There's really nothing good that comes of it. So there's just, you know, common sense, which is a phrase I hate would dictate that there's not a lot of incentive and, and, and reporting that anybody assaulted you much less the most famous, powerful person in the state, one of the most famous, powerful people in the country. And so several women have come forward and, you know, and, and by the way, it also obfuscates us uh, from talking about the other scandal regarding the nursing home deaths in, in New York State, which arguably is, is far more severe than the sexual yeah. harassment allegations. I agree. What, what are your thoughts on, on, on all of that? I would rather be talking about the nursing home deaths. Um, you know, I I. I don't want to sort of rank sexual misconduct issues uh, in terms of severity because I know that different different people are going to have different experiences of it. But but given given the relatively mild nature of the allegations, I would be I would tend to prefer an investigation. Um, But I, I would also want there to be an investigation of why um, of how this nursing home death um, issue came to be. Cause I think that that is very disturbing. Um, I'm, you know, feeling glad that I didn't get wrapped up in the Cuomo, Cuomo sexual, you know, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, but, everybody. Know. Yep. Yeah. There's a lot of, you know, people who I respected and thought a lot of uh, praising him and, and talking about him in ways that made, this native New Yorker watching his family operate my entire life uncomfortable to say the yeah. least. Like, have you seen the rest of his work? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you know, I you know, I I would never wouldn't say that I that I succumbed to that, and I'm and I'm glad. Yeah. Um, I I will I will be curious to see if an investigation turns up anything. Um, but you know, my hope is that I'm, my hope is that 
um, if there is an investigation and it does turn up that, that these allegations are credible, yeah. that, that he will resign. My hope is that, and my hope is that we will also get to the bottom of, of yeah. the nursing home deaths. Uh, the likelihood of Andrew Cuomo resigning. He's very he's similar in, in more ways than he would like to admit to to a guy like Donald Trump. That kind of faux yeah, masculinity. Sort of bombast. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a tiresome. But it works. Yeah. It works in certain ways for, for a lot of men, certainly men uh, of a certain generation. I feel like that's fading. I, I feel like that kind of yeah. tough guy bully alpha male stuff is, yeah. is, is, is 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 like it's not it's not as effective. It's more transparent. It's easier to deal with. You see it coming. Get out of here. Well, it seems like he'd rather get into a pissing contest with Bill de Blasio than, than actually focus on on COVID relief. Yeah, it's always interesting is, to watch the, the New York governor be jealous of the New York mayor. Yeah. It, does, it almost doesn't matter who it is because the New York mayor seemingly is a lot more famous than, than the governor. Yeah. And the governor gets jealous and he has the power. And it's like, what are we, five? This is yeah, exactly. <laughs> It, uh, it feels like it feels like a very childish argument. Well, speaking to you feels very adult. And I hopefully I kept my above, my head above water here because uh, I'm, I really I really respect your work. And I'm psyched Twins. to have you on the show for the first time and, and look forward to talking about all these other issues that which you can speak to uh, ex- expertly more often in the future. Dr. Thank Miranda. You. I look forward to it. Yeah, everybody. <laughs> awesome. On the Twitter, follow her and all the uh, links are in the show notes to all of Miranda's work. All right, that is it. Miranda, Dr. Miranda Yaver, Jared, Professor Jared Yates Sexton, and so much more. Tell your friends to sign up, subscribe to Stand Up Daily for the best news recap and most thoughtful interviews in all of podcast land. I am Pete Dominic, at Pete Dominic, and all the social medias, and I can't thank you enough for joining me. I hope that you will sign up for a paid subscription right now. Let's go. Let's do it. Sign up to support the podcast, which uh, well over 800 people already have, and hope to see you this Thursday at 8 p.m. at the Stand Up Happy Hour Hangout, as I do every Thursday. That's it for me, and know that you're never alone if you're part of the Stand Up Committee. Join us anytime on the Stand Up Discord platform where people are always chatting away, connecting, networking, and being there for one another in these insane times. Thanks for being along the journey with me. Take it away, John Carroll. See him flee the scene of that
experiment if you stand up. Stand All right, up. we got to speak up, we got to reach up and raise your voice in every way you know how. Don't be toes up, you got to show up. Ain't no better time to do it but now. To the voice inside and listen well, and it'll tell you not to run and hide. It says, Stand up, stand oh, up, got to stand up. Ooh, come on, just stand up. Everybody got to stand up in the darkest hour. Stand up, people got the power. Stand up, come on, come on, come on. And now, an appearance of mine from a few years ago on MSNBC's AM Joy, when I was the only white person on panel, along with Nancy Giles, Torre, and of course, Joy Reid. That's a big deal. Well, you know, let's, let's, go, let's, let's go to the minority. That's a big deal. Let, let, let's go to our, minor, our, our minority in this segment. Uh, Pete Dominic, uh, you know, as you can see now, uh, my goal is to make America great again for you and make, your, make you feel more comfortable uh, yeah. in this situation where you, you really are marginalized as a minority. Is Rush Limbaugh right that we should treat slavery like infidelity in marriage? Just don't bring it up in every fight. I've never been madder at you <laughs> in my life. Not only for, let's pull back the curtain, okay? There was a time in America where all the panelists were white men. <laughs> now, now we've got three black folks yeah. in one studio. Let's just pull back the curtain. I'm right around the corner. Okay? Yeah. I blame Torrey yeah. for this, though, yeah. not you, Joy. Yeah. I'm mad at you that you would ever ask me. The wide shot shows the full extent of our segregation. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, can we make America great again when I can just join you in the studio? Make me am Joy great again. Never ask me, never ask me is Rush Lemon. Uh, right, first of all, is the premise. Uh, it's important that we mention, however, that 50% of white Americans actually believe that we face as much discrimination as black folks. And one of the reasons right. for that is because that while we don't have enforced segregation anymore, we self-segregate. The only black folks we see might be on television. Right. We don't mm -hmm. understand the daily struggle, much less the history of struggle, of people of color in this country. And if you travel down south, you see there are monuments of Confederate generals mm -hmm. still all over the south. Mm -hmm. We don't have a monument to slavery. Yeah. Mm. We don't have any of that. We don't have a conversation about reparations, much less any kind of reparation. So we do need to be reminded every day about the history of this country, especially white people. Yeah, and, and yeah. you know, it's interesting Amen. because we are Preach, the day man. after. Yes. Amen. Uh, right Dominic. on, my white brother. Can I come in there now? Can I come in there? Can I come in with you guys, please? Yes, you can. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. Barack Obama. We are one day after. Um, One of my all-time favorite appearances. Bye-bye.